early voting has begun, and in the coming weeks, citizens will cast their ballots for all of Minnesota's constitutional officers, all 201 state legislative seats, and their congressional representative. Joining me to talk about the coming midterm election is the chair of the Minnesota DFL party, Ken Martin. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me. I'm so grateful to be back with you. I think the last time we met was a couple years ago, so I'm always glad to be here. Yes, every two years. <laughs> so this year, this is my first up-close political experience following a redistricting. I've been struck by the massive changes that redistricting has prompted, especially I think this year, the huge number of lawmakers who are retiring. On top of that, redistricting, all the districts have changed. Is your job significantly harder? Well, it makes everyone's job uh, more difficult, not just mine, but also my counterpart on the Republican side, all of the incumbents, and of course, all the candidates who have a, a lot new ground to cover, new voters to introduce themselves to, and, and certainly new lines to run under. So this once uh, every 10 year process is certainly uh, confusing and frustrating for people who work in the business of trying to get people elected, but it's important. It's an important part of our democracy, and uh, we're really excited about uh, all the opportunities that have been created and there's also been challenges uh, created as well that uh, both parties have to work through in this uh, in this new redistricting map. So one of the challenges in a redistricting is sometimes finding new candidates to run and I noticed that in some uh, some districts some greater Minnesota districts there is not a DFL candidate whereas in some uh, urban districts, there's not a Republican candidate on the ballot. Has a voter's regional residence become a stronger predictor of how they will vote? No, not at all. In fact, uh, if you look at uh, the number of vacancies that we have, the DFL in House races or Senate races, it's far fewer than the Republicans have. Uh, we believe, our party believes, that we need to compete in every zip code throughout the state, meaning we work really hard to find candidates that will run under our party banner. It's important, not just uh, for um, uh, the people people who live in that district to have someone there competing for their vote. It's also important for our top of the ticket races. Uh, we know that when we can test every race in every zip code throughout the state that we have, uh, we create a, a lift. We actually give people a reason to uh, vote. We help galvanize local organizers and volunteers. Um, and so it's important that we have candidates running everywhere. Look, you know, our party um, believes very passionately that if you're going to be a statewide party, you actually have to um, uh, campaign that way and you have to govern that, that way. That's what the party has done. We uh, still uh, win uh, a number of seats in greater Minnesota, uh, and, and sure, that's been diminishing uh, over the years, but there's no doubt that for us, we believe that we have to compete in greater Minnesota. It's part of our strategy to win both statewide and, of course, to win uh, the legislative majorities back. You mentioned a statewide banner. So the governor's race is the race that will garner the most attention this fall. And when voters view their ballot, they will see party-endorsed candidates for a number of offices. So in general, what do you want Minnesota voters to know about DFL candidates who are endorsed by the party? What are the common threads? Well, I think you have, you know, all of our constitutional officers that are running are DFLers. The DFL party has not lost a statewide election as long as I've been chair, and we're not going to start now, knock on wood, but we've got great candidates running under a really positive message about what we've done these last four years to help improve people's lives in this state. You know, during a really unprecedented times where we had a, a global pandemic uh, coupled with an economic uh, uh, disaster here in the state and around the country, and of course, uh, civil unrest due to this long long overdue racial reckoning happening in this country. The reality is, is no governor and certainly none of our constitutional officers have ever faced uh, a series of crises quite like that in our state's history. And I think in most uh, regards, Minnesotans recognize that and they recognize the leadership that's been provided by Governor Walls and Secretary of State Steve Simon, Attorney General uh, Ellison, and of course our auditor Julie Baja. You know, all of them led uh, and made the tough decisions they needed to, to do collectively together to make sure that our state was able to recover uh, and to come out of the pandemic stronger than most other states. And so what I would say is this, the DFL is running on a message of um, uh, community and opportunity. The idea uh, uh, with community that we don't leave anyone behind, uh, including when times get tough, that we make sure that everyone is coming along in this state. And opportunity, uh, thanks to Governor Walz's decisions, we now have the lowest unemployment rate ever in our state's history and, and one of the lowest in our nation 
nation's history. Not only is that unemployment uh, uh, coupled with rising wages, we're seeing a really strong um, economy for businesses, for small businesses and our Fortune 500 businesses. Um, you know, the reality is, is these decisions that were made have helped Minnesota rebound faster than most other states. And again, this is what the record is that DFLers are presenting to voters, a strong state that's been able to recover thanks to tough decisions made by our leaders. There's a preponderance of headlines right now. Uh, voters are motivated by the recent overturning of Roe v. Wade. Voters are also potentially motivated by inflation and the rising cost of food and fuel. What other issues are bubbling to the surface? Well, there's no doubt that people are frustrated by the Supreme Court decision in June uh, and where this far-right uh, Supreme Court majority wants to take this country. Uh, and people have every right to be uh, angry and frustrated by that. And we've seen it manifest itself in elections in Alaska and Kansas and New York's 19th. And we're seeing that uh, here on the ground in Minnesota as well. Um, the reality is, is the other issues that people are talking about when we're on the doors is they're talking about education uh, and their schools. They're talking about transportation. Transportation and, and bonding, making sure that their communities are getting the funding they need from the state legislature. They're talking about the surplus. What are we going to do with the record surplus, which the Republicans walked away from the table on in the last legislative session and left, you know, billions of dollars unspent when it could have been used either to give money back, as the governor proposed, and giving money back to taxpayers, and the Republicans walked away from that, or to actually invest in critical programs, which many DFLers wanted to do. There was a path forward. Uh, Republicans decided decided to walk away from that. And so we're hearing a lot of frustration amongst voters that we live in a state where there's, you know, nearly a $10 billion surplus, a lot of unmet needs, and the Republicans refusing to actually spend that money or return it to the taxpayers. Are you finding your party's ability to reach out to voters easier than in previous years, or is it more challenging to get voters' attention due to the many social communication tools that are so readily available to us all? This is a great question, and I, I really appreciate it, because people think, well, well, boy, it's so easy now to get a message out on social media. You have all these different platforms, and in some ways, I think because of all the different ways that people can get information these days, it's, it makes it much more difficult, actually, to get a um, streamlined message into, into, into the hands of voters. And, you know, uh, to be honest with you, we have to be much more creative in making sure that we are not only communicating on all those channels, but most importantly that we're meeting voters where they're at, right? And we're talking to them on the, on the doors and on the phones and at events to make sure that we're having that personal conversation. Uh, you know, it's sort of funny because I've been doing this work for 30 years and, you know, it comes full circle to when I started with Paul Wellstone and Paul used to say that the most effective form of political persuasion is face-to-face -face conversations with the voter about their hopes and their dreams for the future. And, and that hasn't changed after 30 years. That still is the most effective form of political persuasion. So as technology changes, of course, uh, we still come back to what really works, which is just having a heart-to-heart uh, -heart conversation with your neighbor, your friend, your, your work colleague, et cetera. So. Briefly before we have to close, as we're recording this interview, early voting, absentee voting are underway here in Minnesota. How has this lengthier period of voting changed how the DFL party handles its fundraising and spending? Well, look, first off, we believe strongly in early voting. Our party uh, believes that we need to remove barriers to voting uh, to make it easy and convenient for people to vote. And that's what this early vote uh, does. It allows people to vote between, you know, and now and Election Day at a time of their choosing and when it's convenient for them. Uh, and th that's what we should be doing and not putting barriers up to people. People are busy in their lives and they should be able to exercise their, their right to vote, not just on election day. But let me say that it does change the way we campaign, of course, because that means we have to start a lot of our work much earlier in terms of persuading voters and getting messages out to them. And so in some ways, with the early vote means that you're actually elongating out the uh, amount of time that we're actually campaigning uh, with voters, meaning we have to raise more money, we have to send more mailers, we have to send more messages, all those pieces. So the benefit is, is that we see an increase in voting and it makes it easier for people. The, the flip side of it is it's more money that parties have to spend to try to persuade voters. DFL Party Chair Ken Martin. Thank you for coming in today. Thank you so much.